recent Supreme Court decision that was being held as a victory, hailed rather as a victory for the Silicon Valley may actually be a victory, a victory for the American people. And here to talk about that with us now are the co-executive directors of an organization called IMAC, I M A. Kay, recently one of them, wrote an op-ed on this subject. Uh, Preeti Krishtel is co-founder and co-executive director for Treatment Access at IMAC. She is an attorney who has practiced in a number of countries. Um, in addition, Tahir Amin is with us. Tahir is also co-founder and co-director, and he handles intellectual property at IMAC. And again, IMAC is, well, they'll tell us more about what they do. He has practiced as a solicitor in England and Wales, uh, and it specializes in the field of IP. So first of all, Preeti and Tahir, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. Secondly, just to um, fill in the gaps for our folks, what does iMac do? We at iMac are a team of attorneys, scientists, and health experts who came together over a decade ago to try to solve the drug patent problem. We do a few things. Uh, our primary focus is to reduce uh, drug prices by making sure that the patent system is working. Uh, a lot of our work is directed towards bringing integrity back to the patent system. So we monitor patent offices. Uh, we do a lot of transparency work. We selectively challenge drug patents when unmerited patents are holding uh, competition back. And we work with communities to make sure that they understand their rights and that they understand these often technocratic systems around patents and drug development so that they can be a part of these systems that are really impacting their health and their lives. You know, I, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing that work. And, and I was also glad to see that in your op-ed, uh, you mentioned that, um, alluded to the fact that patents are in effect a monopoly granted by the government to uh, certain patent holders for a period of time. Uh, and that there are there is, of course, legal reasoning and, and social theory behind the whole reason why we have patents in the first place. We've covered the drug issue a lot on this program. And in my own writing, I tr I've addressed it a few times. I, I just think it's important for people to understand why we have patents and what happens when the patent system is abused. And, and as you were just saying, uh, before we get into this uh, latest Supreme Court ruling, as you were just saying, uh, it is abused by drug companies from time to time too. So maybe if you wouldn't mind either of you giving us just an example or two of patent abuse in the drug industry. It's a great, it's a great question. And um, the, the whole role of uh, patents comes from well, from the Constitution in the United States, whereby uh, under Article 1, Section 8, uh, is to progress the arts and science for a, for a limited time. And uh, the, the belief is, the common belief is that a patent is granted for a period of time and then it goes off patent and then the market is open. Unfortunately, uh, industry, the pharmaceutical industry and other industries too, have developed practices whereby they keep stockpiling patents in order to maintain that exclusivity. So the idea that you just have a patent for a limited time, i.e. now it's 20 years, it's increased over the, the uh, century, is no longer the case. So for example, a company will, a pharmaceutical company will file a patent on the basic compound of a drug, but then it will stack up several patents. And in some cases we've identified drugs such as Humira, Revlimid, which have over a hundred patents. And what the idea is, is that these companies will do different formulations, different processes, different sort of physical forms of the compound, um, all of which have been a, a sort of standard practices now after over in the last 20, 30 years. But they eke out an extra year each time. And so these overlapping patents can amount to giving a company at least a period of protection up to 40, 50 years. Uh, 
And when they do that, they can uh, charge extremely high prices for those drugs and uh, putting it out of the reach, of putting them out of the reach of some patients or putting strains on individuals financially or the entire health system financially, right? Absolutely. And, and, and so generic competition can't enter as early. They have to litigate their way through these barriers, this, this thicket of these patterns. Uh, many generics will end up settling because they know they're just going to be caught up in litigation for so long. So they just take some kind of settlement money or they make a deal and they say, well, we'll come on to market maybe five years later than I could have had this, the initial patents expired. So, um, so, so just to go to the original point, the idea of incentivizing R&D and research into uh, developing new drugs is that's the premise of the patent system in terms of that incentive mechanism. But I think that we've gone beyond that now in terms of how companies are using it as business strategies to maximize profits. That's right. One of the questions we keep asking ourselves is, well, what good is a medicine if nobody's getting it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so many examples of this, but more recently, we've been talking a lot about the drug company Celgene, who's applied for over 100 patents on the cancer drug Revlimid. You know, we did an analysis that showed recently that the overspend that America is incurring on Revlimid during these years is to the tune of $45 billion because Celgene is able to keep patenting on the same medicine dragging out the life of its monopoly, and then we're not able to get those cheaper generic versions, so we're spending much more as a country than we should be. And of course, that $45 billion represents money that could be spent saving lives in other ways, uh, instead of going to the bottom line profit of a company that's manipulating the patent system. And I don't know about Revlimed in particular, but uh, to make it even more well, for me, infuriating, uh, a lot of times this is done with, uh, you know, as, as, as you were saying to hear, um, and as, as you were also saying, Preeti, uh, the purpose of the patent system is to encourage research and development, and yet, in many cases, this patent manipulation is being done on medications that were developed where the research was done at public expense, where private enterprise didn't even take the risk and yet manipulates the system to maximize their profits off it. Isn't that more or less accurate? There's definitely cases of that. Not all drugs that come into the marketplace originate from public funding, but there's certainly a number of drugs that do. Um, now, of course, the initial research that's done is very upstream and needs to be developed so that it can be humanly consumed. And, and so there is some work that needs to be done. But that's a case by case basis. But there definitely is a, a modern day strategy uh, within the patent system where companies are not using it really for research purposes, but to eke out as much protection as possible. And I think that's the light that we as an organization are trying to shine of where the problems are. And just to that point, I mean, uh, just even just getting an extra six months patent life can be worth a billion dollars depending on the drug. Yeah, so they're investing, I'm sure, a lot in uh, not just attorneys, but lobbying and everything else. Um, and now, uh, Preeti, uh, you, uh, and again, we're talking with Preeti Krishnal and Tahir Amin of uh, IMAC. Um, uh, so Pre you had a uh, op-ed published in The Hill uh, dot com, a Supreme Court victory for lowering drug prices. This is the case of Oil States versus Greens Energy Group, and uh, you called it an understated victory with far-reaching consequences that will positively impact families and communities across America. Now, as you point out, most people are talking about this as a victory for the Silicon Valley and the tech elites. Uh, how does this uh, particular ruling turn potentially turn into a victory for uh, working families and communities? So in 2011, uh, Congress passed something called the America Invents Act, where within the U.S. Patent Office, they created an appeals board called the PTAB. It's the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. And what the PTAB is able to do is essentially uh, reverse some of the patent office's decisions if they were decided incorrectly. So let's say, for example, the case I was giving you about Celgene on the cancer patents. Let's say Celgene uh, received dozens of patents for that drug. 
and let's say somebody else comes in, either a generic competitor or a public interest organization such as ourselves, came in and gave the PTAB evidence to say, you know, those patents shouldn't have been granted. You're letting Celgene have decades more protection than they should. The PTAB serves as a check and balance in the system to say, oh, wait, you're right. This evidence does show that this was granted incorrectly. We're going to reverse those patents. And in doing so, they open up the market so we can get more affordable versions of those medicines onto the market. And the reason I call that a victory for working families is because today we're hearing you know, that one in four Americans are unable to fill a prescription for themselves or a family member due to the high cost of drugs. We're hearing from states whose budgets are being crippled under the weight of the newer specialty medicines that are just being priced out of reach, forcing states to deny or ration medicines to patients. So we believe that the PTAB is a very important uh, agency and entity that's been brought in by Congress, and we've seen a lot happening with the pharmaceutical lobbies over the last several years to try to either get rid of the PTAB or to exempt themselves as an industry from the types of challenges and reviews that the PTAB is doing. And so in terms of what's going to happen next, you know, it is wonderful news that the Supreme Court has decided to keep the PTAB. I think what we're going to see now is a lot of pharmaceutical lobbying and influence with Congress and other important actors to try to exempt themselves from the PTAB's purview. And I think it's really important for those of us who care about economic fairness, who care about the rights of working families to stay vigilant. Because in other words, I would just add to it. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, um, no, just a small point. I think it's important because, um, as anybody, whether it be a, a group of patients who have concerns about patents being abused, uh, you don't have usually recourse to go to the courts to challenge a patent. The PTAB is the only forum where any person can challenge a patent. And I think that's a really important point to make because had that been uh, disbanded, then it's the only commercial actors that have the right to go to court and usually that's a generic company or somebody who's potentially infringing. But now we have this uh, forum which has remained, which allows people, even though it is still costly, but it allows people to still partake in the patent system and raise awareness and uh, concerns where we think patents are being un 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 granted unnecessarily. So in other words, this decision keeps alive a kind of democratic, uh, a more democratic institution for adjudicating patents that, that uh, might have ceased to exist. A couple questions before we go, so that people can maybe follow this story going forward. Who appoints the members of, of the PTAB, the, the judges or adjudicators, and um, is further congressional action or other action needed to strengthen and expand it, make sure it, uh, it continues to intervene in drug cases? Either, either of you, feel free to answer. Um, okay, great. So these are Article One judges, not Article Three judges that are nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and serving for life. So this was actually the whole issue in oil states, is whether it was unconstitutional for an Article One court to take away property when the Constitution says that property can only be taken by due process, which requires an Article Three court. So the PTAB judges are hired. Um, and I think, you know, one other point to make here is that the, the PTAB is a very important entity. And these topics, you know, can get really technical. Most people, when they hear about patents, it's just, it's a little bit, you know, far removed from our everyday life. But what we're seeing is these entities that are, serving to look over our country's patents, they actually have these enormous implications for our individual households, for our ability as communities to be able to access drugs. And so we're really grateful that we had the opportunity to talk to you about this here today, because I think this type of education for more and more people to understand why the Patent Office 
is so important and the appeals board is so important is hopefully going to help us generate the momentum that we need to make sure that the pharmaceutical industry doesn't succeed in its efforts to get rid of the PTAP. Well, I think that's a fantastic point. And I think that, you know, from what you're telling us, uh, an individual uh, decision on a single drug could mean tens of billions of dollars conceivably to the economy as a whole and uh, a lot of money as well as perhaps life and death for uh, an individual household. So I agree with you. It's very, very important. And before I let you go, um, where can people find out more about your work and your organization? Sure. So we're, uh, our website is is www.i-mak.org and we're also on Twitter you can follow us at IMAK Global that's IMAC Global okay great well thanks for all the great work you do and thanks for coming on the program again we've been talking with Preeti Krishtel and Tahir Amin co-executive directors of IMAC so Preeti and Tahir thank you again thanks a lot thank you